What are some of the craziest financial losses people have had? Let's get right into it and start with number five, real life grand theft. Robert Alexander used to live a lavish style and would spend thousands at gambling tables in one night. He was a video game marketing mogul who'd once worked for the parent company of GTA, Take Two Interactive. However, Alexander's fairy tale life fell apart when he was busted for securities fraud. Once upon a time, Alexander was a very wealthy man. He owned a video game distribution company and sold the company to Take Two for $30 million. Under normal circumstances, that's enough money for most people to live a comfortable life. But Alexander wasn't a man made for comfort. He was made for high stakes and risks, and he explored that part of his life through gambling. Alexander used most of the money he got from the payout to fuel a high stakes gambling addiction. He bought himself a Maybach as well because there's no better car to drive to a high stakes gambling game. But Alexander didn't just use his own money to gamble. He was also fond of borrowing money to gamble as well. You might think that borrowing money to gamble isn't a good idea, but Alexander disagreed. So he borrowed $200,000 from one friend, $700,000 from another, and never repaid a single dollar. What do you do when you lose almost all of your money in a decade-long high-stakes gambling stretch? Obviously, you create a company, fundraise, and spend that money on yourself rather than your company. And that's precisely what Alexander did. After losing all of his money gambling, he started a new company called Kazang. According to a former employee, there was never a coherent vision for how Kazang would make money. But Alexander couldn't be bothered with details like profit making. He also told investors that he'd invested a lot of his own money into the company and that he'd helped to create Grand Theft Auto, so he had a proven track record. He also claimed to have donated about $50 million to a Los Angeles hospital. Of course, he didn't do any of that. Instead, Alexander embezzled the money investors had raised, he spent it on himself, and used it to fund his lavish lifestyle. Alexander went to amusement parks, bought a vehicle for his daughter, and gambled the rest of the money away. But Robert's time living the good life was running out. Robert Alexander was arrested at a hotel on Long Island and was promptly charged with securities fraud and wire fraud. Once Alexander was safely in the hands of the police, he began to snitch relentlessly. His first target was Sherry Pryor Witter, an early investor in Kazang. He claimed that Witter had known that her stake in Kazang was worth nothing and yet sold the papers to another person. He argued that that was insider trading and that Witter should be punished. But Alexander wasn't really concerned with dispensing justice. He had a vendetta against Witter since she'd ratted him out to the police and made sure his entire scheme unraveled. She was the only reason the police were able to track down Alexander, and he knew it. Once he was caught, Alexander quickly threw Witter under the bus in an attempt to save himself. He hoped that by alerting the SEC to Witter's fraudulent behavior, the court may pass a more moderate sentence in his case. But that's not the only trick Alexander had up his sleeves. So far, he's managed to avoid being sentenced to jail, despite having already pled guilty. Since making his plea, he's managed to postpone his sentencing hearing three times. The first two times, he cited the coronavirus pandemic. The third time, he argued that he was going blind and needed surgery to fix his eyes. Alexander hasn't been lying low since the swindle either. He's now launched a new business called Paragos. The company is a marketing firm and is currently taking on contracts. Hopefully, Alexander doesn't set up shop next to a casino. Number four, bearish intentions. Jimmy Kane was the CEO of Bear Stearns and was worth over a billion dollars at one point. However, in just over a year, Kane lost almost all of it. How does someone lose a billion dollars in less than a year? Well, the story starts with Jimmy running Bear Stearns. The company doesn't exist today, but when it did, it was one of the biggest global investment firms in the world. Kane, on the other hand, was a young boy who'd come from a humble background to lead the company. He had attended Purdue University, but dropped out halfway through to join the army. Kane left the army soon after to become a photocopier salesman. He also spent some time selling scrap metal. From there, Kane would rise to become the 
CEO of Bear Stearns after a chance meeting with Bear Stearns' then CEO. When Kane was eventually promoted to CEO, he indulged heavily. He picked up an infamous habit for creative medication and was known for his chronic use of the devil's lettuce. In the end, Kane would be more known for his role in the 2008 stock market crash. Jimmy Kane's journey to being the CEO of Bear Stearns started with a game of bridge, a card game loved by everyone's grandma. In the late 60s, Kane quit his job as a photocopier salesman and decided to move to New York. Some people moved to New York to become hotshot lawyers or bankers. Kane moved to New York to achieve his dream of being a professional bridge player, which was a thing? When Kane got into the bridge circuit and started working his way up through the rankings, at some of these games he would meet a man named Alan Greenberg, better known as Ace Greenberg. Greenberg was the CEO of Bear Stearns at the time, and he loved playing bridge as well. After meeting Kane at games a few times, Greenberg was impressed by Kane's wits and decided to hire him as a stockbroker at Bear Stearns. And that's how Kane's adventure at one of the biggest firms in the world began. Over the next 10 years or so, Kane proved that a college degree or an education in finance wasn't necessary to be a talented stockbroker. He quickly became a partner at the company, and a while later, he was named president. When Greenberg was about to retire, he decided decided to hand over the reins to his protege, Jimmy Kane. Under Greenberg, Bear Stearns was known as a conservative company that avoided too much risk. Under Kane, it was the opposite. Kane increased the company's leverage ratio from barely any to 35 to 1. That means for every dollar that Bear Stearns owned, it had borrowed $35. The company also dove into new markets and launched aggressive hedge funds. Through all of this, Kane developed a love for the giggle plant and an unintentionally worked hard to earn his reputation for it. Kane was always publicly denied his love for oregano, but knowledge of his relationship was the worst kept secret on Wall Street. But that didn't stop Kane from reaching dizzying heights of personal success. His investment strategy was risky, but it worked well for a short while. He was able to amass a 5% stake in Bear Stearns, and the growth of the company soon meant that stake was worth a billion dollars. Kane became the first CEO on Wall Street to become a billionaire through equity. Soon, though, things were going to take a wild turn. Unfortunately for Kane, the going was only good for a short while. In June of 2007, two of Bear Stearns' highly leveraged hedge funds collapsed, and this revealed the chinks in the company's armor. As the funds collapsed, Kane was unreachable as he had gone for a 10-day-long bridge tournament. Yes, Kane still wanted to play bridge, despite being one of the most powerful CEOs in the country. The loss from these hedge funds revealed that Bear Stearns was a house of sticks and things started to snap little by little. The impending mortgage crisis worsened things as Kane had overexposed Bear Stearns to mortgage-related investments. Within 12 months, Bear Stearns' shares plummeted to $30 from an all-time high of $172. It became obvious that the company couldn't continue as an entity and needed to either file for bankruptcy or find a buyer. JP Morgan came to Bear Stearns' rescue and bought it for about $10 per share. This was an almost 99% reduction from the company's all-time high. In the end, Jimmy Kane's fortune, which had been worth a billion dollars, dwindled to less than 60 million. Kane had gone from being a billionaire to a millionaire in just 12 months. But it isn't all bad for Kane. He did somehow achieve his ultimate goal. At the time of his passing, he was ranked number 35 on the American Contract Bridge League's list of the best players of the decade, making him a winner and a loser. Number three, Grounded Jet. Kernbrell Tompkins is a former Patriots player who was accused of stealing over $250,000 from COVID relief funds through unauthorized access device fraud. Kernbrell Tompkins had withdrawn about $230,000 from Miami area ATMs as a part of the fraud. The money was part of funds supposed to be dispersed to individuals and businesses who were hard hit by the pandemic. Tompkins was able to steal this money through several stolen identities. This case is especially disturbing because Tompkins used to be a relatively wealthy man. As a player for the Patriots and part of the NFL, he earned about $1.4 million in earnings throughout his career. However, it seemed those earnings couldn't let Tompkins live the life he felt he deserved. So, he sought to supplement those earnings through fraud. Unfortunately for Tompkins, free lunches are never free. Our footballer turned fraudster was eventually caught by the police and was soon charged in court. Tompkins pled guilty to one count of unauthorized access to Vice fraud and one count of aggravated identity fraud. The court sentenced him to 25 months in jail with a year of supervised release. Number two, Iron Mike Trainwreck. 
Mike Tyson was one of the wealthiest boxers of all time, but he lost it and eventually filed for bankruptcy. In the 90s, Tyson was the toast of the town, the cat's pajamas, as well as the dog's tuxedo. He'd conquered the heavyweight division and was enjoying all the trappings that came with that title. He hosted lavish parties with some of the most glamorous people on earth and was always decked out in incredible jewelry. However, Tyson's day in the sun was never going to last forever. By the beginning of the 2000s, he was already running low on cash. And then came the divorce from his second wife, Monica Turner. Mike's income meant that he was going to pay a high divorce settlement, and he simply didn't have that much money in cash. So Mike started selling off his properties. The first to go was his beloved Connecticut mansion, complete with a nightclub and casino. Aside from having to pay for his divorce, he also had pretty huge debts. Tyson owed the British tax authorities about $4 million dollars in taxes and owed the IRS about 13.4 million. He also owed his law firms, a music producer, his former trainer, and his financial manager. These debts totaled more than two and a half million dollars. Mike also owed over $50,000 in child support. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. When he filed for bankruptcy, it was revealed that Tyson was in debt by over $27 million. For years, Tyson spent money with reckless abandon. From 1995 to 97, he spent up to $9 million in legal fees while throwing a $410,000 birthday party. He also spent a small fortune of about $230,000 on pagers, an ancient communication device that just beeped a lot, and cell phones. And he owned two tigers, which is what you'd generally do when you have a lot of disposable income to spend. The thing is, those tigers gulped up to $150,000 each per year on feeding alone. Mike's spending habits had been notoriously out of control. In one of his more famous excesses, Tyson once bought his ex-wife, Robin Givens, a 1.7 million pound solid gold bathtub. He also had a proclivity for buying every car he could. Tyson had the rare Lamborghini LM002, which was worth over 100,000 pounds. He had an Escalade and a Hummer H2. The prize of his collection, however, was his incredible 400,000 pound Bentley Continental SC. By 2003, Tyson was completely bankrupt, but things only got worse for him. Two years after his bankruptcy filing, Tyson pled guilty to charges of driving under the influence and cocaine possession. However, Tyson wasn't just resilient in the ring. He was resilient in life too. Mike bounced back by launching his on-screen career when he played an altered version of himself in The Hangover. The Hangover was a box office smash that led to three sequels. Tyson's life was finally looking up again. He appeared in the sequel two years later and finally cemented his reputation as a changed man. But some of Tyson's fans still want to be reminded of his crazy days. As Tyson stepped back into the limelight, he discovered that there was a market for people who wanted to take a picture of him biting off their ears. Tyson had famously bit off the ear of Evander Holyfield during a match, and his fans wanted a picture of him doing the same to them. Tyson's team decided to monetize that market and charge $200 per picture. Since then, Tyson has properly settled into his life as a star on the big screen. He's gotten parts in other films such as IP Man and was even featured on a 2015 Madonna track that no one probably heard. Currently, Mike runs a popular podcast, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson, with the co-owner of his cannabis farm, which earns him a half a million a year. Hopefully, now he can stay out of debt. For a deeper dive into this story, click the link here. Number one, Money Bolted. Usain Bolt is one of the most recognizable people in the world and currently holds the world record for the fastest time ever in 100 meters. Unfortunately for Bolt, he recently had a run-in with scammers and lost a lot of money. Stocks and Securities Limited, the company in charge of Bolt's retirement fund, had lost over $12 million of his money. When the company was probed for an explanation, it claimed that discrepancies in the Olympic medalist's account were due to a rogue former employee. But according to Jamaican authorities, it appears that Usain Bolt was a victim of a targeted scheme. The scheme had also targeted many elderly investors, but that wasn't the only bombshell. While Bolt was a recent victim, Jamaican authorities allege that the racket had gone on for at least 13 years. The discovery of the scam prompted action from the Jamaican government against Stock and Securities Limited. The government invited international partners and law enforcement organizations like the FBI to investigate the company and get to the root of the matter. Eventually, the Jamaican government sanctioned 
sanction the company and put it under state control. This is part of an ongoing effort to probe every transaction the company has been involved in and understand just how deep the rot goes. Hopefully, it can be dealt with in record time. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments below what you'd rather do if you won 100 million in the lottery. Would you take the lump sum or would you take the annuity?